Good morning, Pathway. Good morning. We're so happy to be here with you, even if it is only virtually. Uh, we have a couple of songs we want to sing uh, with you. And then uh, Jeff DeVries is going to give us a prayer, and then we'll hear the message from Pastor Jim. And then we'll do one more song at the end of that. So um, if you scroll down in the comments or the video description, you'll see the lyrics to the song. So you can just scroll down and sing along with us. This first song is, Lord, I Need You. So go ahead and scroll to those lyrics and uh, please sing along with us.
Uh, this is Jeff DeVries. Uh, I'm one of the uh, elders at uh, Pathway, and um, uh, now is the time in our service for the congregational prayer. So if you would all uh, join your hearts and, and minds in prayer to our God uh, as we pray together as a church. Lord, we come to you in a time of uncertainty and anxiety and for some of us stress we know that you have all things in your hands quiet our fears and grant us your peace restore to us the fellowship of your church in the meantime help us to be the church in a smaller setting to our friends and family we lift up to you all of those who are sick with the coronavirus worldwide and ask for your comfort for those who have lost loved ones to this illness. We lift up nations and businesses and individuals who are struggling financially due to closings and quarantines and students and teachers adjusting to online classes and dorm closures and healthcare workers who are adjusting to changes in procedures and policies and working long hours. Lord, we pray that this pandemic would open the eyes of the world to show that life is finite and fragile, that all may see the need for your salvation. We pray that you would use us to spread your message of hope and peace as individuals and as Pathway Church. Lord, we lift up the Dykstra family to you and the passing of Chris's mother, Sue, from cancer. Thank you that she is free from earthly illness and suffering and in your arms now. We also pray for the Carter family and the loss of Esther's sister. We lift up Rick and Peggy Barron's uh, daughter, Tracy, who has been diagnosed with lymphoma. 
guide the doctors to a treatment and a cure for her. We lift up Bev Swears for Rick and Denise DeCracker. Bev is frail and had a recent fall. We ask you to restore her strength and appetite. We have a couple of people who are connected uh, to members of our congregation who are struggling with drugs and substance abuse. We ask that Ashley and Patrick would get the help they need to get clean and change their lives. We lift up those in our church with struggling marriages and we pray for your miracle of forgiveness and restoration. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have blessed us with, for the blessing of our church and our families, and possibly the blessing in disguise that this virus has kept us all home, that we can grow closer with our families, and bring us back together as one again in your church at Pathway. Forgive our many sins and the times that we don't look to you as individuals and a church, as a nation, as the world. Help us to see you in all things. We pray this in all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey kids, welcome to the lunchbox time. Instead of going with the lunchbox, we've asked Keegan to give us a lunch plate. So Keegan's going to give us a presentation of his objects. Here they are. And now we're going to ask Keegan to explain his connection between his objects and our readings for this past week. Take it away, Keegan. So this is the rocks that, like, they rolled to the tomb. And then the angel pushed it away, and then, and then the and then when Mary got there, the angel was sitting on the rock. So, and then there was a Roman, and then the Roman soldier. That's what this is, and it they helped crucify Jesus. Cool. Thanks, Keegan. And I want to encourage all of you other kids to keep reading your passages. If you're interested in doing the lunch plate for next week, every parents let me know by Facebook. See you next time. Hey there, Sunday morning. How you doing? This is me back here on Wednesday. I wish that I could see you. It's been a strange week with the coronavirus and everybody being indoors and nobody gathering to meet with each other. However, it's good that we meet. It's good that we do this at a uh, certain time, that we keep a routine. And we. it's good, for instance, that we continue our readings. Uh, this past week, we finished the book of Mark, and we began reading the book of Luke. I'm going to go back to uh, the book of Mark and take a look at that. the big question I think that's that Mark is posing for us in his book. Uh, right now, we're dealing with the big question of the coronavirus. And, and what is this new situation look like? What, how, do, how are we to deal with this? And I think there's a question underlying the book of Mark uh, that once we answer that big question, I think it will help us answer the questions that will be coming uh, in days ahead. So here we are looking back on the book of Mark, and here is the big question. Who do you say that I am? As for Mark, He's laid out the answer to the question right at the beginning, at least as far as he's concerned. He says the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Mark then ends his book with the women and a huge question. They are bewildered. They fled from the tomb in terror, telling no one, for they were afraid. Mark leaves us hanging. What do the women believe? I think he wants to return to that question, what do you believe? In fact, questions are not only at the end of Mark's gospel, they are throughout. The crowd says, what is this new teaching when they come to Jesus? The disciples, they say, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They're terrified. Folks from his hometown sneer, isn't this the carpenter? Christ then says, 
who do people say that I am? He asks his disciples, but then he gets more pointed. He gets back to this central question, who do you say that I am? The chief priests are asking Christ, by what authority, or Jesus, by what authority are you doing this? The high priest says at the end of the story, are you the Christ, son of the blessed one? Because if you say you are, we're going to nail you. We don't believe you. Pilate then says, are you the king of the Jews? A question he asks repeatedly. So not only are these questions at the end of Mark's gospel, but they are throughout his gospel. Mark then gives us a host of possible answers. I've taken the liberty to build this word cloud. Here we see the frequency of some of those responses. By far, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man most often, like 13 times over. But then there's Son of God, King of the Jews, Jesus of Nazareth, John the Baptist. Herod mistakes him for that. And then there are those sneering responses like, are you the Christ? Are you the King of Israel? Accusing him of being a false Christ. The people don't know. They say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Or maybe he's a prophet, or maybe he's Elijah. When it comes down to the question placed to Jesus by the high priest, he says, I am the Son of God. Mark stakes it out for us as well. He lays out his gospel in three acts. And here's where Mark shows us what he thinks. In Act 1, in Act 2, in Act 3, he wants to prove his point, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. In Act 1, at the baptism, he quotes the Father speaking from heaven, saying, You are my beloved Son. And then, at the transfiguration, he quotes the Father saying the same thing. This is my beloved Son. And then, at the end, an altogether different character answers the question. The centurion, the Gentile, the Roman, the oppressor. He realizes this man was the Son of God. So Mark has laid out his claim, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and he brings it back. To... So who do you say that I am? Pathway, who do you say that Christ is? Now I want you to be careful about your answer. Peter claimed that Jesus was the Christ, but by his behavior, it became apparent that he wasn't thinking the same thing that Jesus was thinking. When you say that Jesus is the Christ, or that you say Jesus is what? What do you say Jesus is? And does your behavior match your words? For instance, is Jesus your life jacket? What I mean by that is this. If we're in the water and it's freezing cold and we're going down and we don't have one of these things on, we'll be real happy if somebody tosses one, a life preserver, a life ring, or an orangey or whatever. We'll be happy to receive one. If you understand that your life is full of sin and darkness and you're groping about in the dark or you're feeling like you're going down, you're going to be happy to have a Savior. That's a big deal. That's one of the things that Christ is all about. Is he your savior? Is he your life jacket? Or maybe Jesus is your mechanic. <laughs> you getting it? <laughs> now mechanics are definitely good guys to have around. You want them for things when, when things are broke. I, I just went to my mechanic this week. And when we're broke, when our lives are broken and in pieces, our relationships, that's a good time to call on Jesus. If anybody can fix it, he can. The only thing about treating Jesus like a mechanic is that I don't think about him when things aren't broke. Is that okay? Well, then there's the Santa thing. You know, we come to Jesus with a list of things that we want. You know, I'd, I'd really like a new sleigh, or I'd really like the coronavirus to be gone. You know, the things that we ask God for are usually good things. We want, you know, 
brokenness to be restored. We, we want to get along with our spouse. We want to get along with our boss. We want to get along with our kids. We wish our kids would behave. Uh, things that we need. Uh, you know, I got I to gotta fix this thing in the house, and so a raise would be great. Uh, we come to Jesus with our list. And, you know, our rationale is sometimes we've, we've been pretty good boy. We've been behaving ourselves, and um, I've been nice to people, and I've been to church. Uh, it'd be really great if uh, you could set me up, Jesus, with these things. I think another way that people see Jesus is like a wise guide or a business advisor, uh, someone who's a little bit beyond me. When things get complicated, I can I can look to a specialist. As far as the normal stuff, as far as the everyday stuff, I got that handled. But you know, when things get complicated, that's when I'll go uh, to Jesus and 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 look for help with those. More complicated things. Then there's the life insurance attitude. You know, I got my name signed on the dotted line. I got my plan for when I'm gone. End of my life's taken care of, so I can live the rest of my life however I want. We kind of do that with the Jesus thing too. I got I got my faith certificate. I got the policy all figured out here with Jesus. And you know, what difference does it make now with my behavior? I'm good to go. I'm going to heaven. I can live how I want. Then there's the storybook idea. You know, Jesus' life was just part of an ancient piece of literature, and he's a character for every man, and, and we can learn a lot from Jesus' life. His story is full of metaphor from which I can learn things to live my life better, like a Shakespeare play, full of wisdom, full of humor, full of lessons ways in which I can live my life better. Then finally, there's this guy. <clears throat> For a lot of people, Jesus is a stumbling block. God, an all-powerful creator, intelligent designer, yeah, okay. But Jesus, as the Son of God, virgin birth, died, rose again? I just don't get that. I think a lot of people just trip over some of the miraculous, supernatural aspects that we believe Jesus is all about. I have a hard time buying it. How am I supposed to love a guy who's dead, or at least I can't see him. Okay, so let's review the seven ways we act towards Jesus. First of all is our life preserver. We want him to rescue us, to save us from difficulty, to save us from sin. Secondly, as our mechanic, we go to Jesus to fix us when we're broken or to fix the broken things in our lives. Third, we go to Jesus to ask for things, things that we want, things that we need. Fourth, we go to him as our wise guide and advisor. He's the one who can help us through difficulty, help us to understand, help us to act. Fifth, as a life insurance policy, we want to be assured that we have heaven figured out. Now, that leads some of us to act in ways that are not heavenly. Six, as a storybook character, Jesus is a metaphor. His life is a model example. He's a good teacher. Things for us to learn. And then finally, as a stumbling block. We just can't accept the supernatural claims that Jesus makes about himself. So how do these things compare with the idea of lordship? All of these things that I just mentioned focus on what we ask of Jesus. Can you help me with this? Can you save me? Can you help guide me? Can you, can you fix my things that are broken? Lordship is about what he asks of us. And the Gospels have always set a high standard for what Jesus expects of his people. We're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. What is that going to look like in the midst of a pandemic? We have, we have first responders in our church, nurses, uh, caregivers, uh, people that are laying down their lives for the sake of others, even people who are staffing the grocery store so we can get our food. Loving our neighbors is something that Jesus has always called us to do. In the midst of this pandemic, we're going to have opportunities to do that near and wide. 
And we don't know how bad this thing is going to get. And so we talk about helping our neighbors. It could look a lot different this week than it does, say, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, three months from now. We have no idea. But Jesus has called us to love our neighbors as ourselves. What are the impact? What, 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 how does that how does it translate to loving the people that are in your home that you can't get social distance from? Demonstrating patience, helping kids learn, uh, showing loving kindness to your spouse and serving the needs of others. We have the whole toilet paper thing, right? And that's just a, an outcropping of our selfishness. People are clamoring about this pandemic, not because they're concerned about the least of these brothers of mine. It's because they're concerned about ourselves. Living the Lordship of Christ means to be concerned about the least of these brothers of mine, the children, the, 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 the elderly. And, and many from among our congregation are, are reaching out to help. But again, what is this going to look like a month from now or two months from now? We have no idea. But we have the opportunity to, to demonstrate with our behaviors what we proclaim with, you know, with our mouth, that Jesus is Lord. If Jesus is Lord, that means that we will be living as Jesus is Lord and we are not. So this Lordship thing goes against a couple instincts of ours. One of the first instincts is self-preservation. Jesus calls us to get out of the boat. He calls us to lay down our lives. And that kind of goes against our instincts. Another instinct that it goes against is this idea that I want to be in control of my life. Submitting it to a Lord means that he's going to be calling the shots. And we're not ready to do that. I think we're going to have ample opportunities uh, to think about lordship as the days progress. If, but if we get the big answer right about Jesus being Lord, it will help us sort out the details in terms of how we act towards our neighbor, how we act towards our spouses, how we act towards obeying the government, how we act, all these things that are in God's word that he's been telling us to do all along, submitting ourselves for the sake of his kingdom. It might mean you sharing the gospel with someone. If we have this hope in Christ Jesus that we profess, then we should be able to convey that. We should be able to tell people that we're not worried. We know that Jesus has got this thing. As far as the coronavirus goes, it's just another way to die. We are all eventually going to die. And, and many are going to die uh, of things. Uh, many have already, many of our loved ones have died of things that are not the coronavirus. And, and many more are going to die, probably apart from the coronavirus. The question is still about death. Are we submitting our lives to the Lordship of Christ because we're not afraid of death? We believe that death is going to usher us into the presence of God, and so we're not afraid to die. If that's true, then we should be able to express that hope very simply and very plainly for people. And we should also not be apologetic about sharing the gospel. Because if we believe that what the gospel says is true, that people who don't submit themselves to the Lordship of Christ, that they're destined for hell. What kind of neighbors are we if we don't care? What kind of neighbors are we if we don't tell people? Jesus is Lord, and you can be rescued from this pandemic. You can be rescued from this life of death. We all got to die on the other end of this life. Are we going to be greeting Jesus? In order to do that, we have to come under the Lordship of Jesus. That's what it looks like. In the meantime, this pandemic has demonstrated Lordship by transforming our lives. It's changed the way we do business. It's changed the way we meet together. It's, 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 the kids are home and they're not in school. How unprecedented is that in our lifetimes? The point is, we have all these opportunities uh, to demonstrate a, a new way of thinking, a new way of behaving, but it's really this old one that says Jesus comes first. Using our time, using our energy to, to stay connected to the Lord. For instance, so going back to all these things that we do because now of this new almost Lord of our life is this coronavirus. Uh, how many times have you washed your hands today? You wash your hands because you want to prevent the germs from spreading. But we, uh, 
Christ has always been calling us to, to wash ourselves in him, to, to come under the, the, the righteousness, come under the blood of Christ, to submit ourselves to him, to be washed clean, sort of a daily baptism of, of washing out the sin in our, in our lives, staying in the word, staying in prayer, talking, listening repeatedly. Another practice that we've done, another behavior that we've done because of the uh, lordship right now of the virus is remaining in some isolation, uh, social distancing. Well, the, the word of God has always called us to distance ourselves from sin. The scriptures say to flee from it. Uh, it means, uh, you know, getting away from the negative impact uh, of, of the things around us. We need to be cautious about where we're getting our news and, and who we're listening to on Facebook. There's a lot of negative uh, uh opinions and, and stuff out there, and, and we can express a positive opinion knowing how this ends to the glory of God. We've read the back of the book. We're not afraid. Another uh, thing that we uh, are constantly doing is checking our media feed. You know, at Pathway, we've always encouraged you and we've always provided you with tools to be checking the Lord's media feed, to, 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 to stay close to his word, to listen uh, to what he wants to tell you on a daily basis. And, you know, we have found in a short amount of time, I had a, I had a conference call with uh, a number of the pastors in town last week, and it was so encouraging just to see their faces. I was able to have social contact while maintaining social distance. There, there are, you know, Facebook Live, Zoom was one that I'm playing with, uh, different Skype, different ways that we can do this interaction without physically being in the room with each other. But this social uh, uh, being able to connect with each other is really, really important. And so we can, we can find ways uh, uh, to, to stay in touch with Jesus. He's been calling us uh, to be in constant contact with him. And so using these tools and platforms, uh, we can stay connected to each other. When it comes down to lordship, it's really laying it all down. It's, it's understanding that he is worthy of our worship. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, and we're willing to lay down everything for him. In fact, these things. Uh, lordship means they will continue to trust Jesus even if he doesn't fix all our stuff. We will trust Jesus even if he doesn't give us everything that we ask for. We will, we will even submit our stories to him and say, look, Lord, you write my story. It's all about you. We will be willing to even give up our lives and our security for his life, for his purpose, for his kingdom. We'll lay down our stumbling blocks of those questions that haunt us and, and, and we struggle with about who Christ is. Will we trust him anyway? And finally, are we willing to lay down our lives because our lives are all we came in with and we don't get to take anything out with us. Everything is submitted to the Lordship of Christ. And if that's the case, God says, he who will lay down his life for me will gain it. Mark begins his gospel with his claim that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. In the middle, he quotes Peter, you are the Christ. And at the end, he quotes the centurion, surely this man was the son of God. And all of these are punctuated by the claim of the father. You are my beloved son, which brings the question back to us. Jesus asks you, Pathway, who do you say that I am? Are we ready to renew a vision for what it means to follow the Lordship of Christ? And not only to say it with our mouth, but to live it with our lives. The kingdom of God is a place where we help one another. The kingdom is a place of forgiveness where we forgive those who have hurt us. Uh, the kingdom is a place where we worship God and we lay down all of our inhibitions uh, about self-preservation and, and not sharing the good news of the kingdom. Are you ready, pathway, to say that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? In the meanwhile, it's helpful for us to remember that blessings aren't necessarily comforts. 
Blessings are things that bring us closer to our Lord. Could it be in some weird way that this coronavirus pandemic alters, transforms, and renews our understanding of the Lordship of Christ? To those ends, God be praised. We will be thankful in all things. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us to be, that you help us to live, that you help us to behave and act according to the model that you have laid down for us in Jesus Christ. So that in all that we do, people may get glimpses of the kingdom of heaven. Where Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, help us to roll that out even now amidst the difficulties of this pandemic, to be able to say that you are Lord and to live that way. We ask this all in the name of Jesus and our desire to see him be glorified, beautified, exalted, and adored. In his name we pray. Amen. I leave you now with the blessing and prayer of a, of a much more mature Peter later in his life when he understood what it meant that Jesus was in fact the Christ. When he said to the people, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jim, for that message. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the service, we were singing songs about being no longer slaves to fear. Um, and now we're going to close with How Great Thou Art. So please pull up those lyrics and sing along with us. i